Um, well, let's uh, stand together, please, and open our Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, Luke chapter 10. And if you're just joining us this morning, we've been going through the Gospel of Luke on Sunday mornings. By the way, what an exciting new book we're in on Wednesday night, the book of Galatians, and um, wonderful book all about the grace of God and how to live the Christian life and how to find freedom from the things that would destroy your life. And so uh, the book of Galatians, and we're going from Romans all the way through to the book of Revelations. We've done Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, now Galatians, and it's a blessing. But here we are in Luke 10, beginning in verse 25. And behold, a certain lawyer, or an expert in the law, Luke 10, 25, and behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered rightly. Do this and you will live. But he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves or robbers who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, Came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him, and went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And he, the certain lawyer, said, He who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said, go and do likewise. Lord, you have come and done far more for mankind than all of the good stories in the entire world put together. In fact, Lord, you have done what no one else could do. You paid for the sins of every human being who has ever existed, who exists at this moment, and who will yet exist. You paid the full price. And then you invite men to come to you and to receive you personally as Savior. What a gracious God you are. We ask, Lord, that as we have these minutes together, that the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, would work in each one of our lives and reveal Jesus Christ to us. 
And may we not just be those who hear and understand, but may we be those who take seriously what we learn of you. And by grace and by divine enablement, obey you. And thus find you accomplishing your will in our lives, conforming us into the image of Christ. How we love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. What a contrast this section is from what had been happening. When you go back up to verse 21, for example, in that hour Jesus rejoiced, and as he was rejoicing, he was also thanking God. He spoke of God as his Father, and he praised his Father, and he acknowledged that his Father is Lord of heaven and earth. Uh, reminding, Jesus was never forgetful of this. He knew it, of course, but it's a tremendous comfort to us to be reminded that God is the Lord, not only of heaven, the master of heaven, but he's the master of earth as well. The other thing that Jesus was so happy about, and the word rejoice there means just uh, extravagantly happy, he was just thrilled if we could have seen him. I mean, he was overflowing with joy, enthusiasm. He was thankful for two things that God had hidden from the wise and the prudent and revealed the truths of God to babes or to common men. And he said, Father, it seemed good in your sight. He, he was perfectly happy. He was, he was thankful for the revelation of the truth that was being brought to man, and he was thankful for how God chose to do it. He was very at peace with the way God was doing things. No reason not to be. Can God do anything wrong? Absolutely not. We think he's doing something wrong when we don't when we're not paying attention and we forget God's in control and everything he does is just perfectly right. The other thing that he was not necessarily so uh, rejoicing about, maybe he was, but he was just declaring the fact that all things have been delivered to me by my Father. Now, this is an interesting, important truth. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all God, the three of them. They're equal. There's not, a, there's not a sliver of difference in terms of who they are. Yet among themselves, we can assume a decision was made by the Father to put everything, to give everything to Jesus. He said, all things have been delivered to me. I was studying late last night in my Greek books, the word all. You know what it means, don't you? It means all. Studied it all night, all night long. But imagine for a moment, will you, this one person, Jesus Christ, and then the Father, he chose, he said, Son, I'm, I'm delivering all things to you. Now, if you belong to Jesus, you're part of that all things group. You've been delivered to Jesus Christ. Can you think of anyone better to be delivered to? I can't. Jesus was making the statement that nobody really knows who the Father is except the Son, and no one really knows who the Son is except the Father, 
And the only people who know the Son are the persons whom the Son reveals himself to. That's a, a statement not to say God is exclusionary, only wanting to reveal to some, but it was, it's simply a statement, look, Lord, you've given all things to me. Nobody really knows you except me, and nobody really knows me except you and the one to whom I reveal you to and reveal myself to. And so Jesus, the one who has all things, is also the great revealer. There's no greater joy that he has than to reveal to a person the truth. Why would that be? Well, very simple, because the truth will set you free. From, from what? Well, it'll set you free from the guilt of your sin. If you've come to Christ, you're no longer guilty. It'll set you free from the penalty of your sin. It's been paid for. It'll set you free from the power of sin. Oh, it'll still bother you. You'll still struggle with it. You'll still have your moments and your failures, but you're not like you used to be. You were enslaved to it completely, but now you've been set free from its power. You've been set free free to know God. You've been set free to fulfill the purpose of your creation. The reason God created you was that you might know him, that you might enjoy him, and that he might draw near to you. And that your life would bring glory and honor to him. Now, you might say, well, gee, that's kind of self-centered of God, isn't it, to create people to do these things for him? But, well, it, it sounds like that a little bit, but when you stop and think about it, I can't think of anything, and nor can you, that would be any greater than to be in touch with the creator of all things. And since he is the creator of all things, it's only sensible to give him the praise and the honor and the glory for who he is and for what he's done and what joy comes into a person's life when they're really connected with God, lined up, having that spiritual wisdom and understanding. And then to be able to walk in the footprints that God has ordained for you in the collective wisdom of God, planning out for you a life. When I was in the Marine Corps, inducted, volunteered, I might add, and inducted in Jacksonville, Florida, and then brought up to Beaufort, South Carolina, where the Marine Corps recruit, where our boot camp was, Paris Island, and we were on the bus, early in the morning, I don't know, two, three, four o'clock in the morning. And, uh, you know, macho, we're in the Marine Corps, a bunch of idiots, really, you know. And all of a sudden, this drill instructor gets on the, on the bus. And I can't repeat in this room what was said on that bus, but you can well imagine he didn't say, hi, it's so nice to see you. Welcome to Paris Island. We've been waiting for each one of you, and we've got a little bed prepared for you, and we're just excited that you're here, and if you'll just please come with me, we'll take you and get you your uniform, and we're going to, you know, just love you, and blah, blah, blah. It wasn't that at all. It was blankety blank, bleep, 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 bleep. And then he said to us, can you bleep, 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 maggots, see those yellow footprints out there? He said, I want you to go out there and put your left foot on one of the left ones and your right foot on one of the other ones. And that was the beginning <laughs> of purgatory. I never used to believe in it, but that was it. But basically what was being said there was, look, we have a plan for you. 
we're going to turn you into a Marine. You're going to be something different by the time we're through with you. And it starts by you getting off this bus and going and standing there. That's the first thing you need to do. And once you get there, then we'll tell you what the next step is. It's just the direction of those who are in charge of you. Well, God has a very footprint plan for you. And what a joy to be able to say, Lord, good morning. I want to walk in those footprints that you have for me today, whatever they may be. Now, kings, priests, prophets, Jesus said, have desired to see and to hear what you are seeing and hearing as he spoke to the disciples privately. But they didn't see it and they didn't hear it. He said, but you're seeing it and you're hearing it. What was he talking about? Well, he's talking about himself. He said, the prophets in the Old Testament, the kings in the Old Testament, they long to see the Messiah. You men are seeing him. Here I am right here. I've been with you now for over three years. What a blessing it is for you. And of course, what a blessing it is for you as a Christian. Because through the eyes of faith, you also see Jesus Christ. You hear him. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Now, it wasn't always that way. You didn't always see Jesus. You didn't always hear Jesus. You once were blind, but now you see. You once were lost, but now you've been found. And so here's Jesus rejoicing and happy and filled with such extravagant, gracious responsibility displaying and revealing himself to these men and through these men to other people. But what a contrast then in verse 25 when a certain lawyer, a religious lawyer, an expert in the law, studied the law, he stood up and he tested him. The book of Matthew says he tested him but the context is to try and trap him. And, and, uh, and if it wasn't that, it was just to engage in philosophical argument of which many of the religious leaders love to just talk and not do anything except talk. And this question that he was about to ask was apparently one of current controversy among the religious leaders of the day. And I might add that it's a very, I can't think of a more important issue. And it's one that is not only controversial even today, but it's very confused in the minds of many people. And so Jesus is going to be given a question designed to test him, and he's going to answer the question. But typical of Jesus, when asked a question, he answers it by asking a question. So he said that the question was at the end of verse 25, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now half of that question is a very good question. But there's something in that question that is completely a problem. And it's reflective of the misunderstanding that he had and that many people have today. It's found in a two-letter word. What is the word? It's the word do. You see, they thought, they, they were wondering about eternal life, the hereafter, heaven, God, and they knew that not everybody went there, but he was asking the question about eternal life, the problem was he and his group thought 
that having eternal life was a matter of doing certain things. And if you did these certain things, you would then inherit eternal life. So Jesus said to him in verse 26, what is written in the law of which he was an expert? What is your reading of it? He kind of threw it back on him. You work in the law, you read it every day, you study it, you're an expert. What, what would you say is the answer to your question? And the lawyer quoted from the book of Deuteronomy and the book of Leviticus. He answered him in verse 27 and he said this, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And then Jesus responded, and he said, you have answered rightly, do this and you will live. Now there's a problem. The problem is twofold. First of all, there's a huge misunderstanding about the purpose of God giving the law. Well, well let me say this. There's two things about the law that are important to understand, might be better. First of all, the law was never in, given with the intention of being a ladder to heaven, and I'll comment more on that in a moment. But the reason, one of the main reasons God gave the law is simply to show man the best way to live. When you follow the laws of God, now, granted, some of the laws of God were for the nation of Israel only, but much of the law contains the principles that, when understood and applied, make for a blessed life. So God gave the law to show people how to live. You have to remember the Israelites, the children of Israel, uh, were a, 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 na a nation of people surrounded by nations that lived doing everything that was right in their own eyes. They were completely given over to the desires of their flesh. Do you think that was a happy existence? Do you think that was the right way to live? Do you think that's the best way when people live as if there is no God and they do what they want to do from their wicked hearts? No, of course not. And so God gave the law to show people, hey, if you love God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength, in other words, if you really are serious about this and you love your neighbor as yourself, and by the way, that's a summation of all of the Ten Commandments, if you do that, you know what? You're going you're gonna to have potentially the best life that you could ever have. What the leaders of that day thought, and they thought incorrectly, was that God gave the law in order for you to obey so that you could go to heaven. And the Bible clearly teaches that it is clear that no flesh is justified by the works of the law, for by the law is the knowledge of what? Of sin. The law is a moral mirror. And when you look in the law, you see the moral imperfections of your life. That's called sin. Now think for a moment with me about how deluded this lawyer was. If you love God, he said, quoting the Old Testament, he's, first of all, he said, you shall love the Lord your God. You have to do that. But then he said, with all your heart, just completely, which would include no break, with all your soul, a genuine commitment, with all your strength, and with all your mind. And then secondly, your neighbor is yourself. Well, let me ask you, 
Has anybody ever done that? <laughs> do, you, do you know anybody who's been able to love God that way? There's only one person who's ever done it. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. He came and he fulfilled the law. Impossible for him to sin. As a man, he lived the law fully, completely. In addition to that, as mentioned as in our prayer, he took upon himself and became sin for us. He who knew no sin, became, he became sin for us. He became sin. And he died not only for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. That though he was rich, yet he became poor, that you through his poverty might be made rich. He paid for your sins. He not only lived righteously, but he paid for every one of your sins. And then he proved that he not only paid for the sins, but he conquered sin and conquered Satan by rising from the dead. So a perfect man paid completely for everyone's sin and then conquered the one who brought sin into the world. Satan, he destroyed the works of Satan and he rose from the dead never to die again. A righteous man, completely righteous. And then he said, listen, whoever will believe in me, I won't turn them away. And the Bible says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. So in addition to all that we've mentioned, then there he is, the perfect man, the man who paid for our sins, the man who conquered death. And God says, if you will receive him, I will give to you all of that perfection. All of that victory. He clothes us. He justifies us. That's how a person gets saved. It's not by doing something. It's by receiving somebody. By turning to somebody. Having faith in them. It's not working for salvation. It's receiving the work that God has done. The problem with this lawyer is he could have trusted Christ instead of testing him. What a sad deception he was in. Here he is with the Son of God and he could have just trusted him. But he was testing him, trying to trick him. And so Jesus asked him the question. He answered it. And Jesus said, well, in verse 29, you've answered rightly. If, if you could do all of these things, you'll have eternal life. But notice now in verse 29, because this is where the story gets juicy. You like juicy stories? This is a juicy story right here. Every story has a little turn to it. But he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, Who is my neighbor? You see, he was looking for a loophole. Just how would you define neighbor? Common debate tactic. You've asked a question, there's an answer given, you're a little uncomfortable with the answer and you realize, you know, I think I'm in trouble, so let me, well, what do you mean by that? It's a very common tactic. 
And I think it also reveals that this man thought, you know, on the first part of loving God, I think I've got that one pretty well nailed. Which, of course, he didn't. But he thought he did. But it was probably on the second part that he felt a little bit of conviction. And so he was trying to get out of the problem he was in. He was trying to justify his himself. We, you, we talk that way. We'll say, well, they're just trying to justify their behavior by doing this or saying that, right? A little background would be very helpful here before we get into the story. We're going to meet a man who is called a Samaritan. And back in 1772 B.C., the nation of Assyria sent the defeated northern kingdom of Israel into exile, immediately deporting 20,000 Hebrews. The conquering Assyrians brought in foreigners to replace the deported Israelites, which led to the intermarriage of Jews and Gentiles. Jews of the pure lineage despised the offspring of these mixed marriages. There was tremendous um, what's the word I'm looking for? Animosity and um, discrimination. There was tremendous anim animosity that arose between these full-blooded Jews and these mixed-blooded Jews or Samaritans, so-called because they lived in Samaria. And this group that lived there were so separated from the rest of Israel they started their own religion, building their own temple on Mount Gerizim. You may remember where a lady asked Jesus, uh, which mountain do we worship on? You guys say over here, we say over here. There was hatred. The Jews hated the Samaritans. And the Samaritans hated the Jews. And so I think that that lawyer felt a little twinge of who he really was. You see... He had just heard that law, that moral mirror, and you can't hide the real you from the shining pure light of the mirror of God's law. So in being a little convicted about the neighbor part, he said, well, well who is my neighbor? Seeking to justify himself. And maybe he thought, you know, if I can somehow get out of this Samaritan problem, I'm, I'm okay. And they're Samaritans and they're half-breeds. And he was trying to justify himself. It's a little hard to put it all together. Well, Jesus in verse 30 answered and he said, and the question was, who is my neighbor? Jesus said, and by the way, this is often called the parable of the good Samaritan, but it's so suspect that it really wasn't a parable or just a story that Jesus told to make a point, but an actual fact. And it could have been a fact that was repeated often. But it was perhaps a fact that was repeated at least once and was a well-known fact. He said a certain man, it was a Jew actually, a certain Jew went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. A little bit more background before we get into the real story. That narrow road from Jerusalem to Jericho is 17 miles long, and it was notoriously dangerous to travel on that road. It descended some 3,600 feet, and its short curves provided excellent hiding place for bandits. The excess of thieves earned this thoroughfare a name that means the pass of blood or the road of blood. It was a very dangerous place to travel on. And so a certain Jew went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among thieves, robbers. They were waiting. And here's what they did to him. They, first of all, stripped him of his clothing. In that day, cloth was 
one of the great values in life. And they wounded him. They beat him up. And they departed, leaving him half dead. He was in really bad condition. Now, by chance, just by chance, a certain priest, a religious leader, came down that road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. He just saw him and went on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, another re religious person, when he arrived at that place, he, at that place, he came, and it gives you the impression that he paused. He came and he looked and passed by on the other side. But in verse 33, a certain Samaritan. Now, that lawyer at that moment would have felt his hatred well up within him right there. A certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, he would have loved it if Jesus had said, and a certain Jew, but he didn't. He said, a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, he came where he was. So you've got these three people. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And the word compassion here is a word that means a deep moving within the inward spirit. He was deeply moved inside. The Gospel of Matthew uses it three times to describe Jesus' loving and active relationship with people. He's deeply compassionate inwardly. Imagine that, our Lord, deeply compassionate. He was moved with compassion on him, and he went to him. So he walked over to him, and he bandaged his wounds. He did that by pouring on oil and wine, kind of as an antiseptic. And then he put him on his own animal. He set him on a little donkey, and he brought him to the day's end. And he took care of him. I love that. He took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and he said, take care of him. I love it. He said, you take care of him. And whatever more you spend than what I've just given you, when I come again, I will repay you. So that's the story. And then Jesus asks a question at the end of the story in verse 36. The question was, who is my neighbor? Jesus just told the story. So in verse 36, Jesus says, so which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? Remember, the law says to love and your neighbor as yourself. So which do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? Who loved this man like he would love himself and care for himself as if it was himself? And he said, he who showed mercy on him. And then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. That's all that that story says. There's no further explanation or anything. But one of the things that's true about this story is the fact of criminal inhumanity. Imagine. You ask, well, what does this story have to do with us today? Well, the wounded man is a picture of how humanity going away from God is battered and robbed by the devil. When people go away... They get battered and robbed by the devil. They get out of God's protection. We live in a world of people who are walking away from God. And they're going down, down, down. They have hearts that are crushed, bruised, bleeding, and broken. They may be wounded emotionally, spiritually, physically, or economically. Some are suffering because of broken homes, abuse, or addictions. Many won't even have a good meal today. 
Others live in fine houses but are caught up in cults or humanism or liberal religion. All of them have been stripped, robbed, and fatally wounded by the devil. And then we see in this story also the issue of what's been called casual indifference. A priest and a Levite, they both walk right past this helpless man lying there in his own blood. I was in Los Angeles the other day, leaving the airport, and went. And a, my GPS took me in a funny way for these s different streets. And by the way, you'll be happy to know I didn't drink much water on my trip the other day. Learned my lesson well. No chewing plastic bottles for me. No getting in the express lane by myself. It's three hundred and sixty-one dollars fine, by the way, not two seventy-one. I think just over a week's period they upped it about a hundred bucks. Nobody on that lane. I was tempted, but I didn't do it. But as I was there in traffic waiting at the light, I saw what looked like a dead man lying on the grass in front of a gas station. And I, and I thought, is he dead? He looks dead. His foot looked like it was twisted. I thought, looks like this is twisted the wrong way. I, all I could see was his foot in one of those shopping baskets that you know, homeless people have. And there were people walking by and cars going by and nobody was doing anything. And I, I'm waiting to get up to see, is he, what is this? I mean, I wasn't going to stop for him. I just wanted to know, is he... Is he really dead and really, are there people who are doing nothing about this? That's what I was thinking, but I wasn't going to stop. I just wanted to make sure he was dead. Well, he was just taking a nap. I thought, I felt better then. But I, but I know this story, don't you? People dead right on a main street and people step over them. You've got to step over you. Indifference. The priests were the ones who performed religious rituals of that day. The Levites were the custodians of the religious laws. And Jesus was teaching that religion with its rituals and rules cannot save you, your wounded neighbor needs something more than that. People all around are bruised and battered and beaten and weakened and robbed and dying. They don't need rituals and rules. What they need is Jesus. They need a friend. We come to church, we sing our songs, and we think we've done God a big favor. But we may be just like these people Jesus described. They didn't beat the man. They didn't rob the man. Their problem isn't that they did something. It's that they did nothing. The good Samaritan who came along and ministered to this wounded man is really a picture, many believe, of the Lord Jesus Christ. For a Jew to befriend a Samaritan was an unthinkable thing because they were a despised race. Yet Jesus was telling this lawyer that he needed to be like the Samaritan who showed genuine compassion, and this is what we need to be like as well. A person who has compassion sees people through the eyes of Christ. Compassion means seeing the suffering with feeling. And the Bible says that the Samaritan saw him. The problem with so many of us is we just don't see. We don't see people. We don't look. We're so busy we pay no attention to hurting people who are all around us. Thank God that that good Samaritan saw the injured man. The Samaritan went to where the man was and ministered to him as he was. He bound up his bro this broken man and bound up his 
broken spirit. He put him on his own beast and he brought him to an inn and he cared for him. If you turn with me in your Bibles, please, to the uh, First John, the, the epistle of First John, right after Second Peter. First John. Let's turn there for just a moment, please. First John chapter 3. First John chapter 3, beginning in verse 14. We know that we have passed from death to life. John the Apostle and his fellow workers and the believers to whom he was writing are in that word we. We know that we have passed from death to life. How do we know? Because we love the brethren. That's a statement and a half, isn't it? That's the proof positive of being a Christian. We know that we pass from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. I have to say that I was half telling you the truth and half not. I'm not certain I would have passed by the man. I know that I wanted to get on my way, but it wouldn't surprise me if I did pass right by him. Somebody else will take care of it. I'm not a Los Angeles person. I live in Visalia. I've got, I've got busy. I need to go. To, I need to eat dinner. I've got to get home. I shouldn't have told you that part of my story. I, I, I think I should have left that part out. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. That's number one. Second part of verse 14. He who does not love his brother abides in death. If we love our Christian brothers and sisters, it proves that we have passed from death to life, but a person who has no love is still dead. Oh yes, Christians can slip and fall into hatred. We can get the best of them. But this isn't what it means here. It means, what's your life like? Do you hate anybody? Are you abiding in hatred? Do you hate them? Is that who you are? Do you hate a lot of people? This lawyer would have. He would have hated all those Samaritans. So I want to know, tell me who my neighbor is. He was hoping Jesus would say, everybody except the Samaritans. If you have hatred in your life, if that's what you live in, some of you live lives of hatred. You hate people. You hate them. You have to deal with this verse. It says if you don't love your brethren, you're abiding in death. You're, you're still in death. There are many people who come to church and praise the Lord and give money and serve in the church, but they hate people. They don't do it too much at church, but when they leave here, they, that's their, the real them. Is that you? If it is, you're abiding in death. Whoever hates his brother, verse 15, is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him.
anybody who hates another brother or sister is really a murderer at heart. That's what you are at heart. And you know that murderers don't have eternal life with them. That's pretty obvious. In verse 16, he says, by this we know love. Here, let me define love for you because, because he laid down his life for us. Right away, he says, that's the supreme example of love of giving your life for people who were your enemies. We were at enmity with God. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He laid down his life for us. I mean, they tried to execute a poor guy in somewhere the other day. I can't remember the state, and they... Something happened with the uh, chemicals. Didn't go well. He was a murderer. Whenever there's an execution, you see a lot of people with signs saying, we don't believe in capital punishment. But I've never known anyone who said, I'll die in his place. Not a one. Maybe for a good person, someone might dare to die. He died while we were yet sinners. This is how we know love. It's that kind of giving. And he goes on to say, because he laid down his life for us, and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has this world's goods, he's giving us descriptions and illustrations of love. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? It's a question. My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. If someone has enough money saying to live well and you see a brother or sister in need but you show no compassion, how can God's love be in, in you? Dear children, he's saying, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. Now, he isn't saying that the guy on the corner with the sign is necessarily someone that you should give money to. You may, maybe you should. But he isn't just saying, just go out and give money and do things for every person. We need to be led by the Lord. It's always a very awkward moment pulling up to a stoplight, isn't it, with the person there? Because you know that what's going to happen is they're going to pretend like they don't know you're coming. But you know and they know that You've seen them and they've seen you. That's already settled. And then you know that when you get up close to them, they're going to for a moment not look your way, but you're going to be tempted to read the sign at a minimum and you're going to look at them and then you know they're going to catch your eye and you're going to look away. Or you're going to just sit there very tense knowing they're looking at me and they're thinking, you bum. And I think, wait a minute, who's the bum here? And then you go your way and you feel better. I don't think he's talking about that. But he is talking about sensible care for other people. Prayerful, sensible care for other people. You know, we can't do everything, but we can do something. And God has something for you to do. So he says, don't just talk about it, but let's do it. Verse 19, and by this we know... He's just proving the reality of being a Christian. And by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. It's the fact that we love one another and it's the fact that we don't just talk about it, but we care and our love is demonstrated by action. By this we know that we love one another. It's uh, The proof is in the pudding. And we shall assure our hearts before him. You, If you doubt 
your salvation, just with these two things, you might ask yourself, do you hate people or do you love them? Do you help people or do you not care? That ought to help you figure out where you are in the process of your relationship with God. In verse 20, he says, For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God. If our heart condemns us, if you're sitting here this morning and you feel condemned because you are a person who hates people, you hate them. I mean, I know malicious people. I know them. They're evil, wicked, malicious, hateful, murdering people. And if they could get away with physical murder, they would. I'm certain you know people like that. If you have hatred in your life, that's reason to be condemned. If you are a selfish person and you don't care about anybody else, you have reason to be condemned. And he said, if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and he knows all things. God knows where you are. God knows who you are. And he's greater than your sin. He can help you. If you realize, God, I need help. He's greater than you. He can help you. But if your heart does not condemn you and you say, yes, I, I do love people. I do avoid hatred. Oh, I get these feelings once, but I just try to get rid of them. I don't live that way. And yes, I do try to help people as I'm led. Not the guy on the corner, but people. Yes, I'm not that. Well, then if our hearts don't condemn us, we have great confidence before God. We're assured of who we are. And then notice the, 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 the results, the benefits of that assurance in verse 22. And whatever we ask, we receive from him. When you know the Lord and you're walking with the Lord, you're going to be praying according to his will. You're going to be wanting his will, seeking his will. Whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments. That's another proof of our relationship. And we do those things that are pleasing in his sight. By the way, just a little encouragement about prayer. If you're praying for something that you know is God's will and it hasn't come to pass, guess what? Keep praying. Don't give up. Keep praying. Do you remember when, um, was it Elijah who was praying and he asked his servant, he said, do you see anything out there, a cloud coming yet of rain? And the servant looked and he said, no, I don't see anything. And, and uh, Elijah went back to prayer and uh, asked his servant, do you see anything yet? No, this happened six or seven times. And finally, he said, do you see anything yet? This is in James. You know, it says he prayed that it wouldn't rain, it didn't. He prayed that it would, and it did. And the servant said, yes, I do see something. I see a cloud like a man's fist beginning to shape. And the storm came. And so if you're praying for something, keep praying. Just because you don't see the evidence now doesn't mean it isn't going to take place. God has all things in his plan. Didn't Jesus say, knock and keep knocking? Didn't he say that? Good morning. Didn't he say, seek and keep seeking? And okay. Ask and keep what? Asking. And he said, everybody who seeks, finds, and everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. And to him who asks, it shall be given. Continuing steadfastly in prayer. 
Did you know that when I was a kid, you say, oh, no, here we go, one of these stories now. Look, when you're 40, you tell stories. And that was a story right there, wasn't it? You're, te you're telling us two stories. But, you know, when I was a kid, and you, 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 uh, some of you here, you've never used a phone that you dial. You put your finger in it and dial. It's actually kind of cerobics for your finger. And do you know when you picked up the, well, you can go even further back. Do you remember those of you that had party lines? And you could hear the other party get on the line. Do you remember? You would then be speaking in code at that point, right? Eavesdropper. And if there were people that you loved, you could say little hateful things to them. No, no, I'm just going off with a little illustration here. Let's get back on track, okay? Dial phones. When you dialed and rung somebody up, do you know that it might take as many as 10 to 12 rings before they answered the phone? Do you know why? Because back in that day, that was just the way it was. When the phone rang, you'd say, well, honey, the phone's ringing. She'd say, yeah, it sure is. You might sit there for a little bit and figure out which one of you is going to get it. I mean, listen, guys, just go get it because you're going to go get it anyways. And if you don't go get it, you're going to get it from her. But anyways, uh, you just waited and you just go get it. So the person on the other end calling just, it's rung five times, six times, no problem. Seven, eight, no problem. Ten, eleven, twelve. You're starting to wonder now about that time. Today, when you call somebody, if they don't answer after three rings, you're getting really frustrated, aren't you? We want everything right now. You know they're there. They say, sorry, I'm just not available. I'm not here right now. Yeah. Yes, you are there. Answer the phone. Don't you wish you could push a button on your phone that would electrocute them? <laughs> Remember, we're talking about love here. Not really electrocute them, just give them a little shock. Let them know that you know they're really there. Baloney can't answer the phone. And then now we've gone to texting so we can avoid having to talk to people. You don't have to say, hello, how are you? I'm fine, how are you? You don't have to go through all the civil pleasantries. You can just... Get right to the point. See you at 10. Okay. And then we have the little symbols. We don't even talk anymore. It's dumbing down the whole nation. This next crowd that's coming up, they don't have what it takes to do the job that used to be done by your brain. The whole waiting illustration was designed to say, we are today so impatient with God. But it says here, whatever we ask, we receive because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Just be patient. Are you obeying God? Are you? Are you asking him? Are you seeking him? Has he answered you? Well, be patient. Keep asking. And this is his commandment, verse 23, just to sum this up. This is his commandment that we should, very simple and wonderful, this is his commandment. This is what God has commanded, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, that's number one, and love one another as he gave us commandment. How about that? Now, he who keeps his commandments abides in him and he in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. So the person who's Keeping the commandments of God is the person who's abiding in him. And if you're abiding in him, he's abiding in you. And how you know that he abides in you is because of the Holy Spirit in you who's bearing witness with your spirit that you are the child of God. It's 
So the story of the Good Samaritan. Next week, I have something very, 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 very special to share with you. From the last few verses of chapter 10, the story of Mary and Martha. Please make every effort to be here. I'm not pregnant. She's not pregnant. I'm not going anywhere. She's not going anywhere. But I have something very special that I want to share with you. And we're going to receive the um, offering. I told a, a little funny story first service, and I want to share it with you here. Uh, some of you may remember Pastor Harold Mears from the First Baptist Church. Do you remember him? He was a dear friend of mine. We were as opposite backgrounds, church affiliations as you could possibly be, but somehow we really liked each other and we worked together real well. And we partnered up and led one of the big crusades that came to town. I believe it was either the, it wasn't the Graham Crusade, it was the Harvest Crusade. 40,000 people came. And one of the nights, Pastor Mears had the responsibility to pray for the offering. Now, he was a Baptist. He still is alive. And so they do things a little differently than we do them here. I would never do what he did, but I want to tell you what he did. He said to the people, and he was a very commanding guy, he said, now, you know, this is all very expensive. And he said, I want you to think about the offering we're going to receive, and I want you to pray about it, and I want you to think of a, an amount of money that you're going to give. He really spent a few minutes kind of focusing the people's minds in on how much money they were going to give uh, for the offering. And he said, now, do you have that figure in your mind? And the crowd said, yes, we do. He said, okay. He said, now listen carefully. He said, I want you to double that. And I thought, what a trick is that? I'm going to give that a try. No, no, no. I thought, what a trick is that? I thought, that is pretty slick. And um, no, you know, evil intentions, just the way that he did it. And it was for the gospel's sake. And uh, no problem there. What we're receiving right now is for the, the radio ministry. So do you have a figure in mind? <laughs> we'll leave it there. Ushers, come on up. And uh, th please come on up. And I wonder if we can thank uh, the Lord for Pastor Mike's recovery. That would be wrong. And since we're in the th that grateful mood, our wonderful worship team. Your wonderful pastor. Pa no, I'm kidding. <laughs> oh, what a joy. It is a joy, isn't it? It's a joy, joy, joy deep down in my heart. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you. And we... Thank you for the open door to present the gospel as we would invite Dr. Adrian Rogers' teachings, Dr. Charles Stanley, Chuck Swindoll, Dr. David Jeremiah, J. Vernon McGee, Pastor Chuck Smith, other good Bible teaching churches in the Visalia Tulare area maybe Tom Carter up in Dinuba, other Calvary chapels, not just a Calvary radio ministry, but one Lord that builds up the body of Christ here locally through the good teaching of the Bible. And so, Lord, you know our needs, and we are trusting you, and thank you so much for what you've done thus far. In Jesus' name.